and I think the killer actual line of the whole event was when he said that success is my vengeance. That is the message yeah. of national unity. Success is unifying. People are hungry for it, Jesse. We're sick and tired of this culture that penalizes excellence, that penalizes economic growth. Drill, baby, drill, he mentioned it for a reason. That's what drives economic growth in this country. And so I think that is the general election message you're going to hear from President Trump and from the Republican Party this entire year. Success is unifying. Biden ran on a national unity message. He failed to deliver. Now is our opportunity as a Republican Party, and Donald Trump will lead us to get there to unite this country around the ideals that made America great the first time around. That's exactly how we make America great again. And I'm confident that this can be a Reagan 1980-style landslide if we actually stick to that message. All right, guys. So the Biden administration is panicking. And the reason why they're panicking is because Trump is basically extending his lead over Joe Biden. He has sustained a solid polling average lead over Sleepy Joe, at least since October, so it seems, okay? And since the beginning of the year, Trump has increased his lead substantially in the polling average versus Joe Biden, at least according to Real Clear Politics, that is. And the polls lately have closed up a little bit. The gap has closed a little bit, but I think that Trump probably is going to end up breaking out and he's going to extend his lead uh, heading into the summertime, okay? And uh, this is bad news for the Biden administration. Again, they are so worried about this that they're now using profanity, right? They even got CNN to go on air and to use the S word to describe the things that Trump is saying, okay? They're saying, hey, uh, Trump uh, is saying crazy shit and we have to highlight it. About Biden's new messaging push. Yeah, Brianna, what we've learned is that President Biden himself personally instructed some of his top campaign aides to be even more aggressive in highlighting some of President Trump's uh, more inflammatory and wild comments. Uh, we are told that the thrust of the president's direction was to significantly ramp up the campaign's efforts to highlight the crazy shit that Trump says uh, in public. You know, we've been seeing, of course, for a while, the Biden campaign trying to highlight what they see as the black and white contrast between between uh, President Biden and former President Trump on everything, including their temperament, their worldviews, uh, their policies. And as the Biden campaign is making this pivot to a general election, this reporting seems to show that President Biden himself uh, believes that it is incredibly important to make sure that they are really leaning into painting the former president as being unhinged and unfit for office. And I'm just sitting here thinking to myself, well, um, how is this a new strategy, right? You guys have been saying that Trump is saying crazy things since he decided to run for president back in 2015, and that hasn't worked, right? It hasn't worked. Why do you think it will work now, right? I love how the Democrats always come up with a new strategy, uh, but yet the new strategy just turns out to be the old strategy, right? The thing that they've been doing, okay? So with that being said, it seems as if Trump is actually the person that's thinking outside of the box because Joe Biden is struggling in swing states, okay? He's struggling in states like Michigan, Georgia, North Carolina, et cetera. States that Joe Biden definitely is going to need to win in order to get reelected, okay? And um, Trump is saying that, hey, Biden is not only struggling in some of these swing states, but in some solid blue states or what should be solid blue states like New York, Biden seems to be showing signs of weakness there, okay, in states where he should probably be blowing out the competition, uh, he's actually below 50% in New York. Now, this is still a 12-point lead over Trump, but still, it looks like the gap between Trump and Biden when it comes to New York is closing. Like, for example, back in September, Biden was up 21 points over Trump in a Siena College poll, and now, fast forward to February 12th through the 14th, Biden's up 10, okay, and there's been a slew of polls showing that Biden's lead in New York is closing, which, again, is great sign for Trump. It is such a good sign that Trump has come out and declared that he is going to campaign in liberal bastions, liberal cities like New York, like the Bronx, and uh, I think that this is a great, great, great strategy and move from Trump. Take a look. Mr. President, um, I've long said that Republicans should have a no-state or city left behind strategy. Yeah. Ronald Reagan had that strategy in 1980 and 1984. Um, and you told Maria Bartiromo that 
you may campaign in the Bronx or at Madison Square True. Garden. When might that be happening? Uh, very soon. Look, we have nine months yet, uh, but I'm going to uh, see about Madison Square Garden and we're going to go to the South Bronx and we're going to go to Queens and other areas because if you look at what's happened in New York, I'm not even blaming the mayor. I think the mayor has sort of been told to take a back seat a little bit because they came after him violently. You know, they came after him like they're going to indict him when he started speaking up and now he's become quiet. Yeah, so you see now you heard that, okay? Trump is saying, look, we're going to campaign in places like New York, Madison Square Garden, South Bronx, Queens, and I think that this is an excellent strategy because a lot of these liberal cities are begging for Trump to come, okay? I mean, we've all seen the videos of people in the South Bronx in New York City saying, yeah, I will go to a Trump rally, and we're talking about a diverse amount of individuals. We're not talking about, you know, the stereotypical MAGA hat wearing white man, right? No, no, no. We're talking about individuals across the board, okay, that are saying, look, yeah, we want Trump to come here. We support him. And one of the obvious reasons why is because of how badly run these Democrat cities are, okay? And people are saying that, hey, there's a significant difference between the economy under Trump, the country under Trump, versus the economy in the state of the country right now, okay? So uh, I definitely think that Trump should campaign in New York City. I think that New York can be flipped, right? I think if they work hard enough for it, it can be flipped. Now, again, does that mean that he should put a ton of campaign resources into flipping it? Probably not, unless the polls really tighten up, okay? If, if, if Trump starts to get within five or four or three points of Joe Biden, okay, within that margin of error, then it might be worth really uh, turning it up in terms of trying to campaign in that state and to potentially flip New York Red, which would be historic. I also think that he should campaign in Chicago. Okay, I really do think that Trump should go to Chicago to campaign because there are a lot of people in that city, okay, that are feeling the effects of the border crisis because Texas Governor Greg Abbott has essentially moved the border to these liberal cities, these sanctuary cities, and they're seeing how these policies of these progressive Democrat mayors like Brandon Johnson and Joe Biden running the country, uh, they see the effect on them, right? They're actually seeing the effect. They're understanding what Republicans have been talking about for years now when it comes to the immigration issue. They're finally seeing it, okay? So I think now is the perfect time for somebody like Trump to go into some of these str uh, liberal strongholds and to campaign, right? I think that Trump can go into Chicago, Southside Chicago, hold a massive rally and get a ton of support. I really do. And he's the only Republican that has the ability to do that, right? I, I think that Trump, if any Republican is going to do it, which I would recommend many Republicans do it, okay? I wouldn't recommend they do it, okay? But Trump is the guy I would recommend doing it because he has that type of outreach in regards to being able to reach those people and to speak their language. Trump can do it, right? If anybody can do it, Trump can do it. He should strongly consider campaigning in Chicago and other liberal cities at least Give it a try. At least hold one rally there, right? So, uh, again, interesting strategy from Trump. And I think a part of his strategy or a key to his strategy in regards to, uh, you know, trying to swing some of these kind of moderate and liberal voters over to his side uh, is going to be the VP pick. And he um, talked about the VP pick and his thought process for picking the VP uh, at the Fox News Town Hall as well. And I want to go ahead and play some clips of him discussing the VP pick, because I think what he said here kind of gives us some key insights in regards to how he's thinking about that pick. Take a look. Um, when Biden ran, he pledged he was going to pick a female vice president in 2020. What qualities are you looking for in your vice presidential pick? Well, always the first quality has to be somebody that you think will be a good president, because if something should happen, you have to have somebody that's going to be a great president. A lot of people are talking about that gentleman right over there. And he's been, he's been so great. He's been such a great advocate. I, I have to say, I don't, this is in a very positive way, Tim Scott. He has been much better for me than he was for himself. I watched his campaign, <laughs> and he doesn't like talking about himself, but boy, does he talk about Trump. And I said, you know, I called him. I said, Tim, you're better for me than you were for yourself. But he's fantastic, and he's a fantastic person. Uh, so no, someone, who can, step in. That can, someone who can step into the role. Most importantly, you have to view that. The audience has uh, been asked who they think would be a good choice, and various names came up. Um, 
Uh, one of them was, of course, Vivek Ramaswamy. Yep. He's made a big splash. Ron DeSantis, who's made in, making an appearance today in South Carolina, we just found out. Um, obviously, Tim Scott, Byron Donalds, and a, a big uh, presence here for Tulsi Gabbard. Um, very interesting. Um, are, and Christy Nome as well, I should say. Right. Are, are, are they all on your short list? Yeah, and when can you when can we expect that you will so announce your choice? The one thing that always surprises me is that the VP choice has absolutely no impact. It's whoever the president is. It just seems uh, I remember when Sarah Palin was actually picked and she did have a big up. And then mm. uh, they just went after her at a level that nobody seen. The Republicans themselves went after what they did. But you'll be a one term president because you've already served. Yep. So you can only serve for one term, although they say you'll never leave office. I assume uh, yeah, that you'll do. never leave. There'll never be an ele- another say, election. Don't again. do it. He'll never leave. He's yeah. never going. Oh, these people. They um, are so for that reason, it is important so, who, you're, who you so pick. I think it's very important. But look. First is that, as we said, it has to you know, do with whoever is, you know, it's a very important position for that reason. Uh, you would like to get somebody that could help you from the voter standpoint. And honestly, all of those people are good. They're all good. They're all solid. And I always say I want people with common sense because there's so many things happening in this country that don't make sense. Who wants an open border? Who wants high interest rates? Who wants all electric vehicles? And they're fine, but you want to have choice. You want to go to combustion. You want to go to uh, the, any hybrid. I think the hybrid are much better from that standpoint. But you talk, we were talking about faucets. We're talking about, we should, we're talking about so much. It's all based on common sense. We want a strong military. We want choice in education. We want to have things that can really make our country great again. What we're doing with the open border is a disaster. We are destroying our country. We're going to change that fast, and we're going to get your energy prices down. Mr. President, thank you so much for this. Yeah, so you see, now you heard that. Now, that was a very interesting exchange there, okay, because Laura Ingram framed the initial question about VP, again, in a fascinating way, okay? She says, well, Biden chose his VP based off identity politics, based off race and genitalia. Biden came out and said, yeah, I'm going to pick a black woman. Okay, a black woman is going to be my VP. Now, obviously, you know, Biden did that to pander to the Democrat Party uh, base, which is black women. And that's why he picked Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris also is more progressive than Joe Biden historically. And it balances out Joe Biden's historical, I guess, more uh, centrist Democrat uh, policy positions, which, you know, Obviously, Joe Biden has governed as a progressive, okay? He's been a progressive president, uh, but that's not who he has been historically as a politician. So that pick, Kamala, was pretty interesting, but we know he didn't pick Kamala based off her ability to actually become president and to do a good job if something happens to him. Because right now, the polls show that Kamala Harris is the second most unpopular politician in the country only behind Joe Biden, okay? And I don't think that anybody believes that Kamala Harris can step into the job as president of the United States and do a good job. I mean, even the Biden administration allegedly doesn't believe that, right? Because Kamala apparently doesn't have much say on things, okay? I mean, they actually just kind of laugh when she tries to put her input into policy discussions because she was picked as a token, right? She was literally picked because, hey, you're black, you got a vagina, you know, and hey, you're supposed to just play your role as, you know, a cheerleader for the administration, but you're not going to make any real decisions, right? You're not really the person. Kamala Harris says that she's ready to serve and the VP appears to be showing it by taking more of an interest in the Biden campaign. Now that, according to a new CNN report that revealed Harris believes that she can save the president's re-election single-handedly. Her newfound initiative comes after top Democrats raised concerns about, quote, bedwetting in the president's inner circle, and after the VP was grilled by top Democrats for not doing enough. Sources saying, quote, there are even Democrats who still gripe that the best thing Biden could do for his chances would be to engage in the fantasy of dumping his vice president on the ticket. But Harris has reportedly revealed that she still isn't worried about losing to former President Trump. Nope, the Veep fears that people will stay home on election day and that the Biden-Harris ticket will lose to, quote, the couch. And this is why everybody kind of overlooks her and they look at Gavin Newsom as the next up because everybody knows that, okay, well, he actually probably uh, can step into the job and to do the role. Now, don't get me wrong. 
he would uh, definitely be a nightmare for the country, but he's probably a better executive than Kamala, okay? He actually has executive experience running the state of California. Uh, Kamala did not have that getting into the vice president role, and I'm not even sure if I would say that her vice president role is executive experience considering how I, I don't think she really has all that much to do with uh, the Biden administration's policies or agenda. I mean, look at what she did at the border, right? She was appointed the border czar and then she quit, right? She she was just like, no, I'm not going to do this, okay? She just refused to do it. So, you know, I think this question was interesting. I think the framing of it was interesting. And I think that Trump's answer was a good answer in the sense that he said, look, first and foremost, you got to pick somebody that can step in and do the role, okay? That can be president of the United States, be a good president of the United States. That means that he's thinking about more than just himself, right? He's thinking about, okay, well, what happens if something happens to me? Okay, if something happens to me, can the next person up, uh, continue my agenda and to do a good job, um, which I think that's extremely important. That should be the number one qualification that we're looking at here. Um, but then after that, he kind of, you know, points out and singles out Tim Scott, right? Which to me, you know, I got questions, okay? Because it's not that I don't like Tim Scott as a person. I think Tim Scott is a great guy, right? I think Tim Scott is probably a hilarious guy to hang around for, you know, a number of different reasons, OK, but from a policy perspective, I, I don't think that Tim Scott is MAGA, right? I, I just don't think so. I don't get that feeling. I, I think that he's closer to Nikki Haley than he is to MAGA or Trump. OK, so that's why I was a little bit confused when Trump kind of signaled out Tim Scott. Like, I get it. I understand from a electability standpoint why you would want somebody like Tim Scott. OK, and the fact that Tim Scott recently has come out here and been Trump's biggest cheerleader, right? Uh, in a way that I think has actually kind of made people uncomfortable because it seems like it's very kind of not natural for him. But I don't know. Right. I mean, I, I mean, who knows? Maybe he does love Trump more than himself. Right. Who knows? But I'm just saying, you know, I'm not sure if Tim Scott is the right guy. If we're talking about who can carry the MAGA agenda into the future, just in case something happens to Trump. Now, Tim Scott would be a good pick again from an electability standpoint. And from the fact that we know that there's no dirt on him that's going to get discovered, right? Tim Scott is, is about as squeaky clean of a politician as there is, right? He's very squeaky clean. There ain't no dirt you're going to dig up on him, right? Because that's typically what happens. You know, you pick somebody that's more of an unknown. Let's just say, for example, like Vivek, okay? And not that I think that there's that much dirt on Vivek, but we saw what happened with Vivek in the primary. You had all these people digging up things about him, you know, trying to figure out, you know, why he's fake and he's not really MAGA and trying to disqualify him, Democrats going to do the exact same thing, okay? And Vivek still is kind of an unknown. And that's why, even though I'm excited that Trump kind of confirmed that Vivek is on the list, I still got questions about it because Laura Ingram also named Ron DeSantis. Uh, she named Byron Donalds. She uh, named Christy Nome, And she named Tulsi Gabbard. Now, Trump basically confirmed that, hey, yeah, all those people are on my short list. Now, I'm not necessarily sure if I believe that all those people are on his short list, okay? I think that Trump could be throwing out some smoke screens here, okay? Maybe Tim Scott is a smoke screen, right? I hope he's a smoke screen. I mean, I would much rather have Ben Carson over Tim Scott if you're going the angle of, well, you know, I need a black dude to try to appeal to, you know, black voters, which I'm not sure if that's the angle that he's taking with Tim Scott. I'm just saying, to me, I'm, I'm a little confused. But I do understand the argument that Trump needs balance, right? And if you look at that list, which, you know, Trump didn't, deny that anybody uh on that list is in consideration which i don't think that he would that's what i'm saying like i don't think this really means that much i mean a lot of people are trying to frame this as well trump reveals his vp shortlist I, I don't think so i think there's probably more people on that list i think elise stefanik is on that list i think that this is more of a hey i'm open-minded to a lot of people okay all of these people i'm open-minded to i personally don't think that he's gonna pick ron DeSantis, right but i'm just saying i i do understand the argument that he may need to expand in certain directions and his VP pick is going to determine what he's thinking in regards to winning the general election, okay? Because, you know, it may be possible that it is best for him not to pick somebody that is similar to him, right? It might be better for him to pick somebody that can bring in new voters. That's why Tulsi Gabbard is so interesting because Tulsi Gabbard has appeal with conservatives, uh, but she also has appeal with the left as well, too, because she used to be in the progressive wing of the Democrat Party. She was more the anti-war, progressive, kind of anti-establishment, Jimmy Dore type wing, right, of the Democrat Party. Now, clearly, 
Tulsi has her issues, particularly when it comes to her history on uh, the Second Amendment that a lot of conservatives have issues with. But if, you know, people can get over that, which it seems like they may be able to move past that when it comes to her, she could be a fascinating pick. She could be a dark horse wild card pick because she essentially, again, was a Democrat. She could bring in some of those moderate, some of those disaffected kind of progressive voters who will be like, okay, well, I like Tulsi. Okay, uh, I'm anti-war. I might not like Trump on the economic stuff or whatever. But, hey, I I do like the anti-war, uh, anti-corruption, anti-establishment angle that uh, Tulsi Gabbard would add to the ticket. Okay, so somebody like her could be a good pick. Um, and then you got somebody like Ron DeSantis, who, you know, <laughs> Trump didn't deny that he was on the list, but somebody like him would do the opposite of Tulsi Gabbard, right? Somebody like him would probably shore up the disaffected, um, you know, kind of more, I would say, uh, anti-Trump, uh, traditional, conservative, pro-DeSantis people in the Republican Party that have uh, abandoned Trump or say, look, we're not going to vote for Trump because we're upset about what happened to DeSantis in the primary, which I'm not sure how many of those voters are out there, but somebody like Ron DeSantis would be a doubling down, okay, of trying to ensure that the traditional conservative base comes out and, and votes for Trump because you know what you're getting out of, you know, Ron DeSantis. You're getting a, a traditionally conservative governor that is willing to fight the culture war, right? He is somewhat similar to Trump, but at the same time, on social issues, he's more to the right of Trump, right? So, Again, that would be kind of the Mike Pence sort of pick. That was the thinking behind Mike Pence in 2016, I believe, is that, well, Mike Pence will shore up those social conservatives who may have reservations about Trump when it comes to social issues. Uh, Ron DeSantis will shore up that part of the base, okay? And then, again, you have people like Christy Nome, who, again, is traditionally conservative, but she's a woman. That's an interesting angle. Vivek obviously is an interesting angle because he is more MAGA than any of those people on the list. Um, and he could possibly bring in new voters. But then again, Vivek is, you know, he's very energetic, but he's still somewhat of an unknown quantity. Okay. So with Vivek, you know, he would be the choice for me if I'm looking at who can take the MAGA agenda into the next level if something happens to me. Right. Uh, He'd probably be my pick. If I'm looking for the safe pick, a pick that is not going to hurt me too much, I'm not going to have any surprises, and it has the potential to bring on some new voters, but probably is not going to do all that much to expand the base, uh, but it definitely won't hurt me with the base for sure, is somebody like Tim Scott, right? Tim Scott would be that type of pick. Uh, you know, if, if you're looking at trying to straight up reach out to moderates, get some of those uh, disaffected Democrats, Tulsi would be the pick. OK, uh, and then, you know, she also bought up Byron Donalds and some other people as well, too. There are other options. But I think the thing that I'm taking away from this is that Trump is open minded. and He's still thinking about it, which is a good thing. I personally don't think that he should make a pick until after Nikki Haley drops out of the race. OK, because um, although I don't like Nikki Haley standing in the race from the perspective of forcing Trump to use campaign funds to campaign against her funds that he could be using against Joe Biden, um, you can gather data on how independents are voting and how they're thinking, and then you can use that to help you make a VP pick. And I think that's probably uh, something that Trump should strongly consider, which is to hold off on the VP pick. Don't give out any real hints in regards to who you're going to pick uh, until it comes time to actually make that pick. Okay, so I think that what he said about Tim Scott could very possibly be a smokescreen. Uh, it could be more of a, hey, you know, this is kind of who I'm thinking about, but... I haven't really made a decision. I'm still open-minded to, um, you know, a lot of choices. And I think that that's probably where he's at right now. Let me know what you guys think. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Most importantly, share a black and sort of perspective. Peace.